Welcome to the panel discussion of DOE investments and capabilities in quantum materials R&D, arguably one of the most exciting dimensions of physical science research today. I am Linda Horton, the Associate Director for Science for Basic Energy Sciences in the Department of Energy, and will moderate this panel. The focus of the panel is on research to discover new materials and molecular systems and to understand how to impart and control their unique properties in use. These are foundational to quantum information sciences. As these new materials are incorporated into qubits and related devices for quantum sensing, quantum computing, communication, and other complex technologies, the role of materials research expands to interface issues, functional lifetimes, and a plethora of system-related topics. These challenges require more discovery research and characterization of the functionality at a fundamental level, challenging endeavors requiring forefront theory and computational tools, world-leading experimental capabilities and facilities, and importantly, diverse research teams. Beyond QI research for QIS systems, there's also the use of QIS systems to advance materials research in, in other materials and to develop new capabilities for future research how to actually use QIS understanding and technologies to expand material sciences on other systems. For example, using quantum computers to tackle the most pervasive theory modeling and data grant challenges, or using QIS approaches for next generation microscopes or sensors and accelerators. It is an exciting time for the field. Today, the panelists will provide their perspectives on what among the many research opportunities are the major quantum materials research challenges. Considering the diversity of these challenges, there are investments by many from federal agencies such as DOE, NIST, NSF, DOE, and the ARPAs, D, I, and E, as well as critical investments by industry. This is the basis for additional questions that the panelists will discuss. What is DOE's role in this rapidly evolving field and what investments has DOE made? How is industry addressing this challenge? And perhaps uh, key, how do or can industry and DOE work together because of the uh, breadth of the challenges for this field? Now we will turn to each of the panelists. They will provide a self-introduction and initial comments followed by addressing some specific questions. We will begin with Jim Masevich from Brookhaven National Laboratory, proceeding then to Laura Green from the National High Magnetic Field Lab at Florida State University, Ben Lowry at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, and then Mark Ritter from IBM. Jim? Thank you, Linda. Um, it's, a, uh, it's a pleasure to participate. Um, uh, I'm uh, the Associate Laboratory Director at Brookhaven National Laboratory for Energy and Photon Sciences. At Brookhaven, we have a strong interest in uh, materials science, and this is supported by uh, our hosting two national facilities, the uh, NSLS2, National Synchrotron Light Source 2, and the Center for Functional Nanomaterials. Together, we're we're using these uh, facilities to address some of the materials problems that underlie uh, quantum information uh, science challenges. Thank you, Linda. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm Laura Green, and I'm the chief scientist of the National High Magnetic Field Laboratory, which we call the National Mag Lab. It's an NSF-supported user facility. Actually, we have seven user facilities located at Florida State University, University of Florida, and uh, Los Alamos National Laboratory bridging from quantum materials all the way to biological systems and geology and sustainability. Um, I think I'll hold my discussion as to what we plan to do for the next round. Ben? It was next, thank you. Yes, uh, thank, thank you, Linda. I, ben Laurie, I'm a uh, research scientist in the Quantum Heterostructures Group in ORNL's Material Science and Technology Division. Uh, my research focuses on, on, on the interface between quantum optics and quantum matter. I, and really, uh, I, I guess I'm going to focus my, my bio here on, on my research background uh, as, a, as a junior scientist at the lab and on understanding light matter interactions from the nanoscale to the device scale as part of the continued development of, of quantum technologies 
And to that end, I, I've been working with ORNL's quantum information science group uh, to develop new quantum sensors, new quantum microscopes that can provide classically inaccessible descriptions of matter. I've been working with users at the Center for Nanophase Material Sciences to characterize quantum nanophotonic systems with cryophotoluminescence and cathodoluminescence microscopies. And I'm the principal investigator for a uh, DOE basic energy sciences program that's focused on characterizing and manipulating the material constraints of superconducting and topological platforms for quantum information science. Uh, so I guess in short, uh, as part of a, a larger group of collaborators across ORNL, I've been working to develop new quantum sensors for the characterization of quantum matter, while simultaneously working to improve our understanding of new quantum materials uh, that can be critical to the next generation of quantum devices. And Mark Ritter. Hello, I'm the chair of Physical Sciences Council of the Worldwide IBM Research Division, which includes quantum exploratory science. In my previous role, I managed the entire quantum group, which put a five qubit quantum computer on the web in May of 2016, the IBM quantum experience. Uh, the group has now engineered systems and advanced to larger machines up to over 60 qubits. And uh, as you may have seen recently, the goal is to have a thousand qubits in 2023. So we are uh, expanding our uh, systems as well as the algorithms and applications used by these superconducting quantum systems and have a good idea of our industrial co-design across the whole stack of the system. Thank you. Uh, moving on now to the specific questions for each of the panelists. Jim, in your role at Brookhaven National Laboratory and managing one of the new DOE QIS centers involving many institutions as well as industry, how do you see synergy emerging between your center's goals focused on materials research, the external partners, and the DOE expertise and capabilities? Well, there are, there are two interesting synergies that have emerged that I'd like to point out. One is a synergy between the university and industry folks who are actually making QIS devices, uh, such as Mark Ritter, my colleague at IBM, he's one of the partners in our uh, center, and the Brookhaven folks who are investigating the material science of the components of those devices. The quantum device researchers are driven by a need to improve the fidelity of quantum calculations. And so they're looking for a means to improve device characteristics that are limiting the performance, such as noise or short coherence times. But a key scientific challenge is that we don't know what are the key materials characteristics that correlate with device performance. The synergy here is between the quantum device researchers who have the need to understand where the limitations come from and the material scientists who can leverage the powerful tools of the DOE user facilities to gain detailed understanding of the materials with remarkable energy and spatial resolution. So for example, a Princeton Brookhaven team has utilized two powerful techniques at NSLS2 the National Synchrotron Light Source. One is resonant inelastic X-ray scattering, or RICS, and the other one is X-ray photoemission uh, spectroscopy, or XPS. And they've utilized that to understand the microscopic details of junction oxides and transmon qubits, and to correlate those properties with the lifetime measurements in these uh, devices that was done at Princeton, so-called T1 measurements. By comparing the results for the films deposited using different synthesis techniques, correlations was, were found between the lifetime, this critical T1 lifetime, and the grain size, enhanced oxygen diffusion among, along grain boundaries, and the concentration of suboxides near the surface. So that is a wonderful synergy. And one of the joys uh, that we've noticed of getting scientists working together across these fields, in this case, quantum device physics folks and the material science people, it's the enlightenment both si on both sides. That's a true joy. In our experience, both disciplines have been highly motivated by the deeper understanding that has arisen from partnering with someone whose capabilities and challenges you hadn't known previously. A great deal of excitement is emerging from the ability to work 
with new folks and get new insight into the details of quantum behavior of real devices. The second synergy I'd like to point out involves groups that hadn't sufficiently spoken across the boundaries of their disciplines. This time, between the Brookhaven theorists, including the materials uh, theorists and researchers, facing, who are facing limitations from classical computation, working with the university and industry quantum computation experts. We have a number of theorists at Brookhaven working on at the leading edge on grand challenge problems relevant to DOE mission. These include quantum chromodynamics, deep and elastic scattering, quantum chemistry, and materials theory. With the DOE advancement toward exascale computer, much progress is being made towards scalable computations. However, there are some tough challenges that remain. And one fundamental question is whether there's an advantage for computing with a quantum machine for problems that don't scale well. This is another place where the synergy is rapidly emerging. While some of our theorists have been thinking in depth about scaling, for many of our theorists, quantum computation has been looked at as a future, frankly, uncertain opportunity. We found great synergy, however, resulting from discussions between our Brookhaven domain theorists and those who think about how to execute code in a quantum machine or researchers working on quantum error correction. Of course, there are initial language barriers on both sides, and it takes a little effort to get uh, on the same page, but these discussions are leading to new and deeper collaboration. In general, I, I'd, I'd like to say that one of the most exciting aspects of the new DOE QIS centers uh, are the cross-disciplinary collaborations that are, are emerging now. Thank you, Jim. Laura, as Chief Scientist at the National High Magnetic Field Laboratory, can you give us some insight as to what types of materials research questions you and your staff are pursuing in support of QIS technology? Um, thank you very much, Linda, and thank you, Jim, because that was a great, I agree with everything you said about some of the deepest unanswered questions. Uh, to me, one of them is like, what will the most reliable qubit be? So uh, one of our strengths is that, um, you know, we've been supported by the National Science Foundation for many years, and they've had programs in QIS and um, quantum materials research for many years. And I also want to point out that the Magnet Lab is primarily a user facility. So besides our in-house research, which is very strong, the lion's share of our fundamental research is driven by our users, which is exciting, broadening, and keeping us very, very current with the ever-changing landscape of quantum materials research. I'd like to just give a couple of highlights of things that just happened most recently. Um, this is a, a function of using different, we have seven user facilities besides um, building up uh, magnet technology and superconductivity. Uh, magnets, superconducting magnets. But um, right now, what we talk about is we're striving to find the most useful even designer qubit. So um, what we're doing is looking at emergent phenomena in quantum materials. And you see by coupling spin and orbital degrees of freedom through magnetic fields, this plays a crucial role in different phases and probing different electronic phases and properties. Um, I'd like to just give two examples because it's kind of fun to talk about the science and I won't get too detailed. Um, one example is recently the discovery is what we call Lazarus superconductivity. So this was a heavy fermion. Uh, it's very simple material uh, and it, um, what happens if you apply magnetic field as a function of angle and magnitude. And this is very exciting because it was done both at the DC facility in Tallahassee and we had to go to 65 Tesla pulsed in, um, in Los Alamos. So combining these two things, we found that there were three new superconducting phases found. And what was very exciting as you, in certain angles, if you increase the magnetic field, you go to a non-superconducting phase, which you expect, but then when you go above 35 Tesla up to about 65 Tesla, a whole new re-entrant, we call it re-entrant because it comes in with applied field, uh, appears. And furthermore, it was also discovered very recently that this looks like a triplet superconductor. And what that means is that it may be a candidate for a topological qubit or for topological quantum computing. So again, we're looking at the most basic fundamental properties. 
I want to bring out one of the strengths of the Magnet Lab is that we have several resonance facilities, NMR, MRI, and electron magnetic resonance. And uh, the users in electron magnetic resonance are looking at magnetic uh, uh, molecular magnets. And so recently, there was the first observation of a dynamical spin current. And it's going from an antiferromagnetic material to a non-magnetic material, and then it's uh, converted to an electrical signal. Now, this was done at uh, terahertz, and it's operating at frequencies two to three orders of magnitude higher than current spintronic communications. I also want to point out in our electron magnetic resonance facility, molecules containing transition metals that possess a single unpaired electron spin are promising molecular qubit materials as some control of the quantum phase, me phase memory time has been demonstrated. So what you're doing is you take these, another molecular magnet and by changing the arrangement of the ligands around these molecular magnets, it's possible to change the quantum phase memory time by a factor of two. So this is really worth, you know, so again, we normally think of quantum materials as high field work, pulse to DC, but there's a lot of resonance work going on in this. Um, other user facilities, particularly our high B over T laboratory in Gainesville, perhaps in the future in our advanced magnetic resonance and imaging spectroscopy facility in Gainesville and our ion cyclotron resonance lab, where literally parts per billion mass distinction is, is achieved. We're not sure how they're going to apply to quantum materials, but you know, we're looking at this now and we have a lot of meetings and, and, and talking with our users and with MagLab scientists to see how these new tweaks can help us understand what could be the next qubit. Um, in any case, it's exciting to be in a user facility and working with great scientists. And this is indeed a very exciting time for quantum materials. Thank you, Laura. It's, you reminded me that uh, when I think about interfaces, I should also have mentioned interfaces between techniques of char for characterization because that is certainly key in this field. Uh, moving on, uh, Ben, as a staff scientist at ORNL, your work focuses on the development of quantum optical sensors and quantum nanophotonic systems. What do you see as the major challenges in making these types of systems a reality? Thank you, Linda. I guess that it's, a, it's a broad question, and, and so I, I might try to answer by, by kind of illustrating the continuum from quantum optics to quantum materials because photons really are an ideal platform for quantum information science, because quantum optical systems in general conform very nicely to analytical models. We can describe exactly how we expect a quantum optical system to behave, and in general, plus or minus losses in the measurements, it does. Uh, once we start integrating photon material interactions, things get a bit trickier. Uh, so at the all optical side of things, uh, for example, uh, quantum random number generators, all optical quantum random number generators, are now very much commercially available quantum technologies. Uh, there's, there's not a whole lot of, of additional development required. That, that, that's been a success already. At ORNL, we've uh, recently received an Excellence in Technology Transfer Award from the uh, Federal Laboratory Consortium for Technology Transfer for some of our quantum random number generator patents. So these systems are well understood physically, available commercially. The major obstacles at this point are the development of, of, of reimagined readout schemes for, for higher bandwidth, lower cost, better integrated systems. Now, once we start thinking about light matter interactions, we have a patent pending, a patent pending at ORNL, uh, for example, on uh, new approaches to quantum microscopy with entangled states of light. And we understand the physics of these quantum microscopes very well already. But we're still coming up with new ways to leverage entangled states of light for better materials characterization. Nonetheless, the, the, the biggest obstacles here might be the design of, uh, of new low loss microscope readouts that can take maximum advantage of the entanglement in the optical readout field. And I also work on the design of, uh, of, of new nonlinear materials that can generate more entanglement than current sources, yielding a, a larger quantum advantage. So by addressing these technical challenges, we can enable the, the exploration of classically inaccessible materials properties with the next generation of, of quantum microscopes. So on the 
further on the material side of things, uh, today's quantum devices uh, that rely substantially on, uh, on photon interactions with matter have certainly advanced radically over the past few decades. So for example, microscopes that use optical readout of the spin state of nitrogen vacancy centers in diamond for high resolution magnetic field imaging are now commercially available from several uh, international small businesses based on research that was or originally performed at, at Harvard and MIT. Superconducting single photon detectors are commercially available from domestic and international small businesses based on pioneering research at NIST. And I imagine we're, we're all aware of, of, of the, uh, the substantial academic and commercial investments into the control of microwave photons in superconducting qubits for quantum computing. But for all of these different applications, for, for NV-based magnetometers, for superconducting quantum sensors, for superconducting qubits, we still need to advance our fundamental understanding of light matter interactions in, in all of these systems. And as highlighted by, by Laura and by Jim, partnerships that can combine world leading material science, microscopy, quantum information science, and device engineering are essential to further improvement in these fields. And so I guess I would close then by adding that ORNL's new quantum science center is focused on the development of topological quantum materials for quantum information science. And all of the issues I outlined above for today's quantum information technologies are gonna be critical for the development of these future topological quantum technologies. And these collaborative partnerships that combine fundamental material science, quantum information science, and commercial device development are gonna be essential to the development of, of, of this next generation of quantum devices. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. A great example of the importance of the bridge between doing the science to understand quantum and then doing quantum to develop the new capabilities that we need for, for future research, as well as bridging between organizations in order to get the dynamic team together. Great, great comments. Thanks. Moving on, uh, Mark, given your role and responsibilities at IBM, what do you see as the major materials challenges related to the development of next generation quantum computers? And what role might DOE play in this research? Quantum states of most types of qubits are inherently fragile as the others have said, they're incredibly sensitive to very sparse impurities in the materials and interfaces of the devices. Researchers have speculated on the source and nature of defects and impurities that limit quantum device performance for more than two decades. However, in most cases, the actual impurities and devices have not been discovered and are largely unconfirmed speculations about the nature of defects have not been very actionable. Therefore, like CMOS device development, researchers try new materials and processes to find a knob that will improve device performance, but without a scientific understanding of the details of the defects. This kind of blind approach to device improvement is painful and expensive and may not lead to the best direction to pursue. The DOA labs have materials and analytics that are unparalleled in their ability to resolve defects spatially and energetically, including strain in materials and interfaces. The DOE tools like synchrotron light sources with beamline instrumentation relevant to QIS materials are unaffordable to industry or universities, but critical to advance qubit performance by helping us understand what and where are the key defects only with this knowledge can we discover the best directions to improve performance. Additionally, DOE facilities have some unique materials growth capabilities that I'll come back to, which when combined with excellent analytics, they allow fast turnaround experiments to accelerate qubit improvement. Coupled with materials analytics, the labs also have researchers who excel in computational material science, as Jim mentioned. These skills and the DOE high performance computing facilities are essential to close the loop in our understanding of how defects we discover with the analytical tools like synchrotron light sources or the magnet facility, how these defects couple to qubit states. Undoubtedly, we will discover many types of defects. It is likely that they have very different contributions to qubit quality. And we need to have scientific model for exactly how each type of defect might couple with and cause noise in the qubit. Finally, some quantum devices are sensitive to nuclear magnetic moments which interact with the qubit and cause decoherence, the loss of quantum information. 
DOE labs like PNNL have world leading sources of isotopically pure elements, which will be required to fabricate some types of quantum devices and sensors, as well as analytic capabilities to determine isotopic constituents. On top of this, there are other materials growth facilities at the various labs, including uh, NV center growth materials uh, facilities or, or uh, facilities to allow the uh, growth of single layer of materials, layer by layer. And these types of facilities are critical to explore new device uh, configurations for QUIST devices, quantum information science and technology devices. There, uh, these and other unique capabilities of DOE labs will contribute to advancing quantum technology. Material science is the ground discipline for all types of qubits. And scientific focus on materials using the world leading capabilities of DOE labs is required to accelerate advances in the field. Partnerships between DOE labs and with other scientists and facilities with univers within university and industry will be critical to advance the whole field of quantum information science and the devices that manipulate quantum states. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mark. All of you are deeply involved in quantum materials research. What new research facilities are needed to accelerate or transform this area of research and what role should DOE play? So uh, perhaps we could turn to, uh, to Jim first. Uh, for your comments, and then we can move up the panel. Sure. Um, well, we have, as uh, pointed out earlier, we have uh, some remarkable facilities at the uh, synchrotrons and nanocenters and other light sources uh, for material science. One of the uh, one of the challenges we're looking at is, uh, frankly, a new facility is getting to lower temperatures. Uh, getting to uh, 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 the, the temperatures where these devices are typically working is a challenge for, for our facilities. And so, uh, unfortunately, because of, uh, as Mark mentioned, the sensitivity to environment, uh, these, these devices are typically working below one Kelvin. And so, that's a, a region that we don't typically access in many of our in many of our facilities, and so we're looking at new uh, millikelvin, uh, for example, just one example. We're looking at a new millikelvin scanning probe uh, microscopy capability at the Center for Functional Nanomaterials at Brookhaven. Thank you, Jim. That just sounds like great introduction to Laura at the <laughs> <laughs> National yeah. Magnetic. Yeah. Thank you, Jim. Uh, very, that's, I like that very much. Uh, we have a problem with helium, of course, so um, <laughs> that's going to be a challenge. And thank you for calling on me, Linda. Um, I still am amazed that we've been working on what is the best qubit for so many years, and we don't know who the winner is going to be. And I think looking at extreme conditions at low temperatures, like Jim was saying, is very, very important. It's crucial. But then we're going to have to find a practical designer qubit. So research into new materials is absolutely crucial since there is no winner right now. There's no designer qubit. One of the directions which has been controversial is having a center for materials growth. And one of the things that I would like to pursue, because I have many friends in Europe and in China and in other places, is an area that's gotten very strong in recent years is growth of materials at extreme conditions. So that's growing materials at high pressure, high temperature, uh, in situ characterization by X-ray and other techniques, and then ex situ characterization also. You might even tweak in a high magnetic field and look at materials growth. But this is a, a highly growing area. And I know that, again, a materials hub is controversial, but if you want a center that can really grow materials at extreme conditions to look for absolutely new phases that can't be formed, at ambient, um, at ambient uh, temperatures and pressures, et cetera. Um, this is very expensive and a center that to help researchers go there and try their new ideas, I think would be very, very helpful. And I would like to see, again, what I'm always saying is I'd like to see different, because uh, I love working with many people, different funding agencies, work with different universities and different, um, and different laboratories, uh, certainly around the United States. 
I think that would be crucial to finding new quantum uh, qubits. Thank you, Laura. Uh, ben? Yes, th thanks, Linda. I, I, I might build off a little bit off of, off of, off of Jim's comments. I certainly, o over the last few years, as I've been kind of bridging quantum optics and quantum materials, I, I've, I've started moving towards millikelvin device characterization. And over the last several years, we, we've invested in new millikelvin platforms for, for device measurements in high field. For optical microscopy, which is pretty straightforward because we can use dry systems that don't consume helium uh, and, uh, and manipulate and characterize quantum devices with light with all external controls outside of the fridge, which is convenient. And then to scanning tunneling microscopies at millikelvin temperatures, which is a challenge by comparison. I, and building up that sort of millikelvin device manipulation and characterization, incorporating scanning probe techniques, scanning optical techniques, laser manipulation, et cetera, all in situ starts to push forward our understanding and control of material systems under device operating conditions. So I, so I fully agreed with Jim on that front. Thank you, Ben. Mark? I just have a few comments. I agree with uh, the other panelists and uh, agree that measurements of defects which correlate with qubit performance can only be discovered through these fast turn experiments on things like the NSLS2 beam line. But they have to be done that in conditions that uh, are representative of the materials uh, when they're at low temperatures, uh, which requires very unique facilities, uh, different than we have had in the past because of the, the very low temperature required by uh, qubits. Uh, basically, the energy levels are, are so close together, such a small energy level, of, for example, a superconducting qubit, that it represents uh, just a fraction of a degree Kelvin energy separation. So you have to be much colder than that in order to see any state preservation. Uh, however, you can start exploring the materials, their superconducting behavior and quasi-particles and things like that above that temperature. It's just it wouldn't function as a qubit. Uh, so there need to be uh, proper environmental controls and, and uh, materials studied in the environment in which they are functioning. Uh, and that requires upgrades to some of the facilities in order to round out the information we gather. But uh, these and other facilities are unique and world leading facilities, but we need to apply them in order to find those proxy measurements which are related to qubit performance and then be able to do fast turn experiments to iterate and improve that, those particular uh, materials properties to improve the qubits. Without this, any of the different qubit or transduction devices that transduce a qubit state uh, to optical communication, photon wavelength, uh, or, or even optical uh, qubits uh, and materials for optical uh, quantum computing, any of these types of qubits or transduction require a facilities which will give us those proxy measurements to allow us to improve the performance. Thank you, Mark. Uh, I would now like to move on to a totally different question. Please define an ideal cross-institutional partnership that would accelerate progress in QIS science and technology. What are the changes in implementing, challenges, excuse me, in implementing such a partnership? And, uh, and I hate to put them on the spot, but this seems like I, Mark might, might have the first perspectives on this, this question, if, if, if you would. Oh, sure. I'd, I'd be glad to give a comment here. I've particip participated in many cross-disciplinary research projects, even within IBM, but also between IBM universities and the government. And what I find is the ideal partnership has world-class researchers from disparate and complementary fields collaborating to drive scientific discovery in key areas of quantum information science. The key challenge is to agree upon shared goals which drive real collaboration across disciplines and organizations to solve the most important problems. And that means you have to agree on what problems are most important. Uh, 
because of many different institutional cultures are inevitably involved in any such collaboration, ideal center leadership should acknowledge and work with the distinct cultures rather than trying to change them and uh, also drive the communication and commitments needed to sex successfully deliver outstanding scientific results against this center collaboration work. So I think in a, in a nutshell, that's how I view it. Thank you very much. Uh, to mix it up, we'll turn to Jim Masevich next for comments. Well, uh, I'd like to follow up on something that uh, Mark said, because I, I completely agree. I think it's um, one of the big challenges is making sure that we have shared goals. I see tremendous, uh, like I said, I see tremendous excitement right now in uh, getting people to work across boundaries. I would say the biggest challenge actually has been there's often a language difference because people from different disciplines tend to think about things in different terms, different language. And so getting to know each other takes a little patience and a little bit of effort. But this translation, it's kind of a, you need an interpreter. I think one of the interesting challenges is uh, overcoming the, uh, the, 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 the language and communication barrier. And that's, that actually uh, requires a, a, sustained, a sustained effort um, uh, as, as, we're, as we have learned. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Uh, Laura, do you have anything that you would like to add on this topic? Sure, I, why not? Um, but I must say that Mark and Jim put this very eloquently. I don't have very much more to add. Um, just to bounce off of what Mark said, uh, you know, when, when at the loss of our, uh, you know, when Bell Labs shut down and all these things happened, we wondered what will be the go between, between the bench and, you know, true applications in the marketplace. And uh, we're still working on that. And DOE had a long time ago, if you remember, we had uh, the SciTech meeting where we're figuring out how to do this. Because the problem was, if I'm at a university and I ask industry to help me out, or industry asks me to help them out, it doesn't work that way. So you have to have a shared goal. And that was very exciting because we worked out a shared goal in the, in the group that I was in, which was transmission of electrical power. Um, so I would like to see ways that we can help facilitate that. I don't really know how to do it. It's easy at the Magnet Lab because we have meetings all the time but I'd like to broaden out a lot more. You know, we don't, you know, and to other facilities and other people. And speaking about the language, Jim, that's so true. Even here, if you're talking about NMR, if you're talking about biological NMR versus chemical NMR versus quantum materials NMR, it's, it's like, it takes a while to learn how to translate. So um, again, the just ways to get together and identify this goal and not, and not it's not what's in it for me or for you, but this is good that we need for our country and for quantum information sciences on the planet. We could do that. Thank you, Laura. Ben, your perspective is probably slightly different. So I thought that it would be, it'd be interesting to hear from you and on, the, on this topic. Well, honestly, three great answers already. I, I don't have a whole lot to add. I, I think perhaps the only thing I would add is perhaps obvious, but I, Based on all of the answers we've heard so far in, in this discussion, we're really reaching this limit where small and large businesses can commercialize today's quantum technologies, but foundational materials research is still needed to understand the fundamental properties that constrain these technologies. And so partnerships that combine commercial development with fundamental materials research I think our, we're, we're absolutely at a point where, where, where these can, can, can be advanced collaboratively uh, and, and sort of a, virtu a virtuous feedback cycle of device development and fundamental materials research can be advanced. So I would like to thank all the panelists for a great discussion of this topic and move to a uh, opportunity for each of the panelists to provide a one minute summary of, of their, their thought. Jim Misevich. Uh, well, thanks. Thanks, Linda. Um, you know, when I, when I look at this challenge, I, I look at the big problem being fidelity, 
uh, the ability to get a reasonable answer out of a quantum computer, which gets to the noise. You know, we're in the so-called NISC era, noisy intermediate scale quantum computing. And how do we get, get past that? And that, that leads me to, um, you know, I think it, it's been the great discussion on materials today because I think the, the, the solution to NISC is essentially a microscopic material science understanding of some of the QIS physical phenomena. And that will allow us to develop the proxies that Mark was talking about. And um, then that will drive, I think, the synthesis and uh, of new materials that, that Laura was, uh, was talking about. Uh, but, but to me, the big, the big opportunity here, uh, you know, driven from the, the limitation and inspired by the opportunity, is that microscopic material science understanding. And I think the DOE's investments in, in the uh, nano centers and, and the national investments, so the NSF and things like the, the MAG lab are, uh, are, are essential for our uh, uh, forward progress on under, getting that microscopic understanding. Laura? Hi, thank you. Um, I'll just spend a short time building on what Jim said. Um, yes, we need, uh, what we need in our materials research is more transparency. So when we look at some of these materials that are topological in nature, that are strongly correlated in nature, very, very tiny changes in the crystal structure have profound changes on the electronic structure. And that's something anyone that's worked on correlated electron materials and even some of these other newer materials, whether it's uh, more patterned uh, graphene, whatever, um, the, the reproducibility is still a question. And what we need to do is between groups, we need to be much more transparent as to exactly how the materials are made, how they're analyzed and how that relates to what we've, what we've measured and the analysis. And I think to me, when I look at these correlated electron materials, et cetera, other quantum materials, that to me is our biggest challenge in understanding that several groups can get different answers on the same material that looks simple, a two component system, a three component system on paper. Let's just get together and work this out. It's much more fun that way. Ben? So uh, I guess just building on, on Jim and Laura's comments, certainly a microscopic understanding of superconducting devices at uh, uh, under the conditions that those devices operate is essential to the improvement of those devices for the next generation of, 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 of quantum devices. Uh, but there, there's an old line that, that, uh, that a bad qubit is, is a good quantum sensor. And so th this can certainly go both ways, that, that we can use today's qubits to probe today's materials in order to advance uh, the, 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 the next generation of materials while using today's microscopy and sen uh, my, my, my microscopy platforms and sensors to advance the next generation of qubits. And Mark. Yes, uh, thank you uh, again for uh, inviting us all and for me. Uh, I think the real question we need to deal with is will quantum information science and technology devices give practical advantage? In computing, we need better devices and error correction suited to the noise statistics of those devices to achieve the promise of quantum computing for practical applications. Uh, and, and what I want to come back to is co-design and cross-disciplinary teamwork are required. It, it, a device alone isn't enough. You need the whole stack of the system or the communication network thought through. And that requires a larger effort on a national level between industrial, university, and government labs in order to achieve the, the practical advantage and promise of these quantum devices. And so I think that is the key focus. We really need to collaborate in a way that respects each other's ideas and IP and unique uh, contributions in order to really be the first in this field and keep our nation first. Thanks. And I'd like to close by saying thank you to all of the panelists for an excellent dialogue on the uh, 
the full spectrum of research opportunities and challenges for materials research to enable uh, successful uh, quantum information science technologies and utilization of those technologies for the future of the field. Thank you very much. Thank you.